I served in the Vietnam uh, War or conflict. <laughs> what was your branch of service? Uh, United States Army. And what was your highest rank? Uh, sergeant. sergeant. Sergeant E5. And starting with, you went to basic training, just give me your general location, the different places you served throughout your career. Okay. Um, uh, my basic training was at Fort Dix, New Jersey. And that's a uh, one-week replacement company and then eight weeks of basic. Uh, from there, I went down to, uh, for my advanced individual training, AIT, I was, down, I was sent to, assigned to uh, Fort Sill, Oklahoma, the artillery school. I was assigned as an artillery surveyor. Uh, and that went from, I believe that was uh, late January until March. And then I got, when I graduated, uh, there were 28 in my class. It's a, uh, it's a very small group of guys that are uh, in, in artillery. There's artillery surveyors, fire direction control people, and the, uh, the gunners, mm -hmm. you know, the cannoneers. And uh, cannoneers, obviously, that's, a, that's the class that I went through. There were 28, 28 of us in uh, artillery survey. There were about uh, 75 to 90 in fire direction control, and that's the brains of the guns. And then there's... Um, about 300 cannoneers, and it's the same class going through the eight weeks. Um, what, what artillery survey did, did, did at that time, that predated uh, GPS. So basically, on maps around the, around the world, we verified locations, basically. And that's what you, that's what, that was the job of artillery survey, you know, because you want to have precise coordinates of where the guns are located relative to the targets. You want to make sure you can find uh, accuracy there. Yeah, you know, and then I was I got orders when I graduated, uh, and I was assigned to Fort uh, Lewis, Washington, which was home of the Fourth Infantry Division. Uh, when I got there, um, my MOS there were uh, since there it's there's not a lot of surveyors per unit. Uh, I was assigned to uh, first of the twentieth artillery, uh, a battery, and that was an Honest John rocket unit, which is nuclear capable. It's a very small unit. The uh, by mid '60s, Honest John rockets were obsolete. We're more of a parade unit, small battalion, uh, great mess hall. <laughs> uh, but it was not. You were a toy soldier. Basically, uh, it was all spit and polish. You know, a lot of inspections, a lot of a lot of parades, stuff like that. But it, it was fun. Uh, while I was there, um, uh, in late spring, we were hearing rumors about. 4th Division being deployed to Vietnam, or Southeast Asia, as they referred to it. Um, after our 4th July parade... That was late spring, 66? Uh, 65. Uh, yeah, 66. And um, July, uh, after the 4th of July parade, uh, the next day, I got uh, called into the early room, and two of us, John Mascaro from Miami, uh, who I took AIT with, we got orders to report to the 2nd of the 77th Artillery. Headquarters and Service Battery, 2nd uh, Battalion, 77th Artillery Regiment, um, and reported there, and they were 105 howitzers. And uh, we got assigned, and there were too many surveyors, so they, they pushed me in fire correction control, and John, they kept in, uh, in survey. Um, I spent the, uh, the next couple of months helping them pack you know, vehicles and so forth, all the equipment, all the, all the crew served equipment. Uh, we started shrink wrapping everything we could and packing, getting that stuff ready for shipment to be deployed on a troop ship uh, to Vietnam. Came home at the end of August. Uh, they gave us a two-week leave. Uh, it took me two days to get home because the only at the time it was an airline strike, and the only way I could get home was military hops. So I was home for about, about nine days. Uh, and then we shipped out out of Port of Tacoma, on the General Nelson M. Walker, that was a United States Navy troop ship. Uh, the voyage took 22 days. Uh, there were about close to 5,000 was crowded on that ship. To give you an example of how many people were there, it used to take about six, six hours to feed everybody. The lines used to snake all over the place. While I was there uh, on that troop ship, uh, I had classes in fire direction control. And I, because of my math background from survey, I've actually picked it up better than the guys that had been trained for it. 
that had been with the unit since you know around the same time I I was. They that's where they took their uh, their basic and AIT with the fourth. That was the, the experiment to train everybody from the ground up, you know, and not leave. Mm -hmm. um, we landed it. Um, Twenty two days later, we landed in uh, in Feng Tao. Actually, we were out in the uh, in the harbor because there's no docks and anything, and then. Um, we loaded onto a uh, uh, landing craft, uh, you know, over the side on ropes and so forth with our uh, rucksacks, uh, M4, M14 at the time, a uh, duffel bag. And it took about 20 minutes to get in. And I remember when they lowered the ramp, water came in. We had to wait across about three feet. And the 1st Infantry Division band was there with a whole bunch of officers and dignitaries. And we formed up. They load us, loaded us onto deuce and a half, gave us a box of sea rations and a bandolier of 100 rounds for the, for the M14, told us not to load up and just sit there patiently. And then they con we convoyed to uh, a, a base camp called Bearcat. And uh, it was in Long Bend and, uh, and near Tonsino, near the Air Force Base. And it was, uh, that was, uh, they had a big Australian contingent there, about 4,000. Um, and that was like our in, in country training there. Uh, toward the end of October, I got sent uh, northwest of Saigon, which is Tainan province, uh, to uh, Dao Chiang. And that was going to be called, it was uh, originally going to be called Camp Rainier, because of where we came from, the state of Washington, set up a base camp there. And it was in the Michelin rubber plantation. There was a big airstrip constructed there on the edge of the rubber plantation. Um, and as soon as I got there, um, and we established the base camp, uh, they started, uh, that's when the United States Army changed their philosophy. They started big unit operations. The first operation I went out to in, um, in November was Operation Attleboro. And, uh, I have to look over here for the dates. Let's see. Attleboro, Attleboro. Uh, here it is. Attleboro lasted from October 17th to November uh, 25th. I came in uh, the latter part of the the latter part of the operation in early November, and we were and that was a uh, 25th Division uh, operation. They, they that was the uh, I have to explain that the first two brigades of the fourth went over in July. The first went over in July of '66. The second went over in August, and we went over in September. The first two brigades went up to the Central Highlands, played Ku Katung Province there. And the 3rd Brigade of the 25th was already there, so they had an experienced brigade. And brigades are, at the time, were between 3,500 and 5,000. Mm -hmm. So we were sent to Tainan Province, and Dao Chang is east of Ku Chi, where the 25th Division headquarters were. And what we did was we were actually taking the place of the 3rd Brigade 25th there. We were learning from the first two brigades. At Dao Chang? At Dao Chang, yeah. And uh, m many of the operations came out of 25th Division control. You know, Tainan, I think, was 190, either 196 Light Infantry Brigade Headquarters or 199th. I keep, those are the two I confuse. Um, also in the same uh, province was, up at An Lock was, I think, 1st Division Headquarters. So anything with the first, we, we also worked with the 1st Infantry Division, too. Um, and then the next operation I was on was... Uh, okay, Lou? Yeah. What I would like to do is I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to slow you down a little bit. I'm sure. I'm going to get some back to the beginning. Sure. After Vietnam, you went back. Where do you go from Vietnam? We'll, uh, we'll talk about Vietnam in detail in a little bit. Okay. But after Vietnam, you, did you deploy back to the uh, US or? I, I, no, I, um, let's see. Flight home to uh, San Francisco. We landed in San Francisco. It was a civilian flight, which was nice. Uh, and then we they bussed us in the army buses to Oakland. Uh, they processed you. Uh, the guys that were getting released, uh, I had 13 months to serve, so they processed us fairly quickly. The other guys that uh, were going to be uh, released from the army and get their you know get the release at the time. Uh, they kept them overnight there, and I remember um, when I came in, it was it seemed like it was nighttime. Um, 
we landed. And the flight is like, I forget how many hours across the Pacific. I don't know if it's almost a full day because you cross the international date line. It seemed like I had breakfast twice. Uh, I, I was very tired. That's all I remember. I was tired and happy. I remember they processed us. We were in khakis when we left. When we got there, uh, we threw away the khakis. They transferred, uh, they put rank on, uh, we had dress greens that they issued to us because it was uh, the end of September. Uh, converted all my funny money, my military payment certificates uh, into greenbacks. Uh, processed me, uh, uh, shots up to date. Uh, what else? Uh, and then uh, I was given orders where I was going to go to and I was given uh, 30 days plus two days travel time. So I had 32 days. I was going to be, you know, and then uh, I had bought a ticket in um, in uh, 90 for placement in Long Bend. I bought a ticket and I had a reserved flight from San Francisco to Bradley uh, in, in uh, at Windsor Locks. And I remember uh, I took a cab from Oakland to San Francisco and I shared it with a Special Forces Captain and a Master Sergeant in the Medical Corps. He, he served in Saigon in, in the hospital. Uh, and, the other, and the Captain was 5th Special Forces. You know, nice guy, really nice guy. Quiet, but really nice. I remember when we got there, um, I had just turned 20, not shaven yet, and uh, I looked like a little kid. And I remember when we got to the airport, there was a demonstration going on. It's about 9 o'clock at night. And I remember I wouldn't get out of the cab because I was afraid. They, they got out and, and bulldozed the way in. I remember uh, when I got inside, checked my bag, uh, you know, handed them my ticket, went to the... Uh, Went to the restroom where they have a lounge and everything, you know, throw some water on my face. And all I remember was a pile of dress greens off to the side from discarded uniforms, you know. And mine, I couldn't do that. I didn't have any civvies. So and, people seeing the demonstrations. Right, right. Basically, it, basically, you wind up wondering uh, what was going on. You know, I figured I was home and, hey, this was, you know, everybody be happy to see me. Obviously, it was the other way around. And, uh, and then I came home. It seemed like I, was, I came home in the middle of the night. I had my, uh, my brother drove because my parents were elderly Italians. And my father wasn't going to drive that far. They were already in their, uh, let's see, uh, my parents would be in the late 60s. It was my brother, my sister-in-law, my niece and nephew were very, very little kids. And they met me, had to be, I don't know, one or two in the morning at Bradley when we came in. All I remember is the drive home, my mother looking at all the ribbons and wanting to know what they were for because she didn't know I, I was over there. Because the address, uh, after all the, uh, you know, my name, my, my rank, my name, uh, uh, and the uh, 3rd Brigade and so forth, 4th uh, Infantry, it said APO San Francisco. And that kind of that kind of fooled her, you know, being an Italian that really didn't know, know English that well. But uh, it was, it was kind of shocking that, you know, she, when she found out I was actually in the war, you know, it was one of those things that kept away from her. Uh, and then from there, I was home for... 30 some odd days, went through a, a, you know, a culture shock, I should say, you know, spent time up at Central at the uh, student center one night when I had some friends from high school came over and they wanted me to wear my uniform and it almost set off a riot in the student center. Uh, but, uh, but I did meet a lot of, you know, a lot of my classmates that, you know, everybody got us, got, went to college, got up to UMass, up to Northeastern, you know, up to University of New Hampshire, New Haven, so forth. A lot of them wound up back at Central for some reason. It was like a, uh, how can I say, it was like the whirlpool. If you didn't make it here, you wound up at Central. You know, not knocking the school or anything, but it just seemed like home was the safest place, you know, to go to college. But, uh, <clears throat> and then I wound up reporting to Fort Carson, Colorado, uh, toward the, I think it was the third or fourth week of October, you know, with the 5th Infantry Division. And I got assigned to 6th six, of the 21st Artillery, which is another Honest John Rocket unit, mm -hmm. which I actually enjoyed because it was another one of these little small units, spit and polish, but put it this way, I didn't have to worry about going back a second time, you know. Even though I did hear rumors that the 5th was going to deploy, some of it was, because they were a mechanized division. And uh, some of it did deploy while I was there, you know. But luckily, uh, my name wasn't in the, in the mix, you know. All right, Luke. Well, that's a nice summary going from beginning to end. Now we're going to... Well, while I, while I was in Colorado, uh, in April of 68, uh, Martin Luther King 
was assassinated, we wound up on riot duty for most of the spring and summer. The only, uh, the only, the, the only thing that made it bearable for me was that I was on a lot of athletic teams. So I was, and as a sergeant, I was given special privilege by my first sergeant that I was allowed to leave the base so long as I gave him a phone number. Uh, everybody was usually restricted. Uh, I was able to uh, get out of a lot of duty, actually, stuff like that. We were deployed uh, a few times, and uh, it's one of the, it's one of the unpleasant things. In other words, I fought, I, I fought in Vietnam. I also had to had to provide force in the United States, which was kind of upsetting. You were deployed a few times as riot. Right, riot, right. Units, right. We went so, to Chicago for a bit. Um, yeah, I forget what what uh, convention was there at the time because that was an election year. Yeah. That, that, was the, uh, that was when Johnson announced in 60, 68 he wasn't going to run. That's Nixon running, right? Yeah, that was Nixon, I guess, I guess Hubert Humphrey, I believe. That was the first time I voted in a presidential election. So, I'm going to back you up now. Okay. I asked, uh, I asked you earlier, were you drafted or were you enlisted? Uh, you... When, I, when, I, when I got out of high school, I uh, applied... Uh, at a few colleges. I got accepted at Central, but I also got accepted at the University of New Haven. Uh, I had played some summer ball, and a, uh, the, he wound up as a legendary coach. He was in his first few years. He saw me play ball, and uh, he was impressed with my speed on the base pass. And he approached me and said, if you apply, I, you can, I can get you, uh, you apply as a walk-on. You pay for your first year. He said, I can get you money afterwards. He said, I'll get you money. He said, you won't be a position player, but he says, you'll, you'll steal bases for me. He was very impressed with my speed. And uh, this guy's name was Porky Vieira. Um, I started uh, working at General Electric in Plainville. I was making a dollar one, dollar eighty one an hour and unskilled laborer. But I, my parents, I, was, I think I was putting in the bank about 65 bucks a week, which was pretty good. I figured if I worked... Till the following summer, I'd have enough, more than enough, for tuition and and, uh, and housing and so forth. Uh, in August, I had to report while I was working at General Electric. I had to report for a, a physical. We met at downtown New Britain at the post office. There were two busloads that brought us down to New Haven, the induction center. Uh, got a physical. Did all kinds of testing all day long. They brought us home that night. Uh, in early September, I got my draft my my card that said I was one A. In October, I got my draft notice, early October. And then about a day later, I got a call from the Army recruiter. He said that uh, I had tested high on the, uh, the GT test, the general technical test. He said, you, you, you're one of the highest guys swearing. He says, I can get you any school you want. So I applied as an, uh, a surveyor in engineers. I never got it. Typical, typical Army. <laughs> I, it's funny. What I was trained for at Fort Sill, for our artillery survey, I never did it. I did everything else but. Really? You know what I mean? Yeah. I, I, had, I, I picked up skills on the go. Uh, I never fought the system. I played the game exactly what the Army wanted. That's what I did. The spit and polish, the whole nine yards. And I picked up every skill I could. And I, I wound up, I guess, to my benefit because I, I rose through the ranks quickly. Um, a lot of the senior NCOs liked me a lot. Um, I mean, it, it paid off. It paid off, you know. In other words, I never bucked it like some of the guys did. You know, they disliked the military. They felt they shouldn't be there and stuff like that. But they, the guys I went over with uh, to Vietnam, uh, even though a lot of them were draftees, a lot of the guys really did a good job. You know, well, we, not to get too uh, idealistic, but uh, years later, people start to recognize the fact that we actually stopped the spread of communism in Southeast Asia. By our presence there, the surrounding countries went through a little bit of turmoil, but we actually stopped communism. About, I think about 70% of the former Vietnam vets believe that. You know? And out of that group, uh, we'd do it again. You know? um, I'm part of that group. You know, I don't feel our time was wasted. A lot of guys, I, I've met some guys that are bitter about it, but uh, I felt that what we did was the right thing to do. You know, so I, I wish that um, that the politicians would have given us more free hand um, 
and that uh, one of my biggest disappointments was Walter Cronkite that felt that uh, after the Tet, you know, we destroyed the Viet Cong, something the, uh, the, French, the French could not do in the 50s. We actually destroyed them in si early 68. The Tet failed, even though they got close in the cities and took over way and they got uh, inside the U.S. Embassy compound in Saigon. We literally destroyed them as a fighting force. From then on in, they were fighting North Vietnamese regulars. They weren't fighting the Viet Cong anymore. The other thing is, is that uh, the United States in the last, uh, in Korea and Vietnam, it was almost like going to a boxing match, except you couldn't use your right hand, and you had to have your shoelaces tied together. You know, uh, when I got over there, uh, I'm, being in fire direct control, we were in the operations center, and I got to see the operations map. And it was kind of strange because you saw these ribbons going through. Some were free fire zones, some were no fire zones, some were friendly villages, unfriendly villages, and you had rules and regulations. I remember when we first got there and issued stuff, they told us that it was like the Wild West. You see the enemy, you have to wait for him to fire to you. You couldn't, couldn't initiate contact. And to me, I thought that was kind of stupid, you know. And, uh, you know, it's like they got to draw first. It was kind of kind of ridiculous. And not only that, we couldn't go into Cambodia or Laos. You know, Ho Chi Minh Trail came down from the north and came out in Tainan Province at the top where it sticks into Cambodia. And I always felt that if you went in after them, guess what? You're going to you're going to stop their lines of supply. And that's that'll that'll that's like killing the uh, that kills the animal. You know, and uh, it, it was it was kind of dumb, kind of dumb. Friendly village. If you took fire from a friendly village, you have to go to a chain of command to return fire and to get artillery support. In other words, uh, the company that was out there had to go through battalion, through brigade, through division, over to uh, Arvin, Army Republic of Vietnam, and then back again. Firefights last minutes. You know, it, I mean, you know, uh, 60 seconds can be life and death to a lot of people. That was, that was one of the things. I always felt we were restricted. You know, why did we have to play by these rules? They didn't. You know, that, that, and I don't know. <laughs> the United States, for some reason, it, is, it seems like they have to champion everybody's cause throughout the world. And to me, it was like a, a, a strange way to fight a war, you know. And with all the stuff that's been written about Vietnam and some of the stuff that was falsified, while I was there, everything was verified, you know. When we said that were so many casualties, there were so many casualties. When we said that we uh, captured so many weapons, uh, supplies, you know, 10 tons of rice, whatever, it was all verified. You know, I got to see it firsthand, you know, and, and some of the stuff later on written in some of the magazines and some of the articles I seen were falsified. You know, sometimes a sanitized uh, casualty, you know, U.S. casualty, stuff like that. But uh, I got to see exactly firsthand, being a, even though I was, um, let's see, at the time, I got promoted after I was there for a few months to Spec 4. Um, as low ranking as I was, I got to see exactly what the battalion commanders and so forth and other, other unit commanders used to come in the operations center. I got, to, I got to hear and see firsthand because I was right on the edge of it, manning my switchboard, my radio. So I got to hear and see all the strategy and so forth of what was going on. And I was privy to a lot of stuff like that. Yeah. I think today, if if these guys were around, they'd be they'd shudder. <laughs> I knew what they were do, what they were doing, but uh, you know, I got to see a lot of it firsthand that the normal average GI doesn't get to see. You know. So you're you're in Vietnam, right? Um, you've you've gone. You were by you went up by operation. You were a part of Operation. What was it? Al Al Attleboro. 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 That was that was the first one that started in October of uh, of sixty five and ended I mean sixty yeah, six and it ended um, ended around Thanksgiving of sixty six and then the following year Operation Cedar Falls and that was run I I think I'm guessing but I think a first division was involved it was all in Tainan Province they were all large unit operations designed to not go after small. They wanted large units of the Viet Cong to attack. Mm -hmm. That was the big thing. Search and destroy. That's where the term terminology came from. That period, they wanted uh, large unit operations to to flush out big. You know, because they didn't want this nighttime small unit hit. They wanted to go after uh, the the main uh, group they were after was the Ninth Viet Cong Division. They were made up of three regiments, 
and um, 371st, 372nd, 373rd BC regiments. I don't know where to get the numbers from, but that's that was the nomenclature on them. And they those they, they were a very very bold division. They would attack in force in different areas. So the big thing was ferrying them out. Uh, the next one was Operation Gazden. That was during the Tet, and I remember Operation, it was, was Gazden, G A D S E N. That was uh, that was from February third to February twenty first of uh, sixty seven. Uh, Cedar Falls was from uh, yeah, uh, it was it was the month of January. Remember, I got back in the base camp. Next thing you know, I'm going out to Gazden. Gazden was up near the Cambodian border. We were within like a stone's throw of it. Uh, we landed in this one open area. It was uh, kind of like it was when we dug in. I remember the first uh, vehicle was a three-quarter ton. They dropped it in. It went right down to its, you know, went down at about four or five inches into the soil. We're going, well, we're not going to be using vehicles here. The guns are going to get in there and they're going to be, you know, and we're going to dig in. I remember we you dig down about two and a half to three feet and you struck water. It was about about six to eight inches of the darkest soil I've ever seen. So fertile and everything. It was an open area and it was like all jungle around it. And um, while we were there, uh, there was an incident. Uh, about the third day out, I went in uh, on our edge of the perimeter and we had set up a tent for fire erection control and we couldn't dig in too well. So we we're going to be out exposed. But it was during a tent anyway. So we figured, you know, you didn't need overhead cover and sandbag, stuff like that. We filled some up to a certain height. And I remember I went out there looking for some uh, some poles for across the bunker we were going to build, and I discovered a grave. And what it was, it was uh, it was a rustic thing with uh, you know with the with long little poles tied, and a uh, uh, part of a, a tree flattened out, and there was the the Viet Cong circle and the star, and the guy's name, and uh, he was a captain. He was only like 19 when he died because it was a uh, mentioned there. I had one of the, we had one of the uh, Viet, Vietnamese interpreters with us, and I remember when I you know it was in it was in about 50 yards into the in, from the tree line, and uh, it was pretty neat. That's out in the middle of nowhere, you know, because I didn't see any footpaths leading to it. So uh, I guess he had died uh, six or eight months prior to that from the date on the on the uh, on the marker, and I remember later on it came down from brigade headquarters that we were going to dig it up. And they found four of us. And I remember I was part of the crew because I found it. And we had a big crowd there, all officers and so forth. And we're digging away. And we go down about three feet. And I uncovered him. And he was wrapped up like in uh, black plastic, you know, like you know, really thick. And it was kind of brutal. And I remember I poked through. Luckily, I got his feet. And it was, uh, uh, <laughs> you could see everything was kind of like gray and it shriveled up a little bit, you know. And you know, we verified there were no weapons with them and stuff like that. I remember we we re re reburied the guy. You know, that was, that was one of the one of the highlights of that operation. It was a fairly quiet operation. The only thing uh, we did was we illegally fired into Cambodia at the time. Somebody took somebody took some fire, and our fire the guns could reach out almost seven miles. So I, I remember we fired, we had a fire mission that went out. And guns, you're talking about the artillery. One hundred fives, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, each battery had six one hundred fives. You know, they would set them up at what they call lazy W. You know, each each point of the W, you know, three here and, you know, and down here, and that's and they're you know because it's set in that W pattern. Uh, when they have a fire mission, they can really blanket an area, you know, and they're very very accurate as far as it goes. Uh, they can get they we our my unit got uh, commended a few times for saving a company. I remember well at well in my tour. Uh, that was actually surrounded. We got rounds within 25 meters of them. That's close. That's really close. That's within the killing range. You know, that's when the Viet Cong wanted belly to belly. That was the, uh, excuse me, that was the, um, that was their strategy. Get right to their, you know, grab them by the belt and stay close to them so that way they couldn't get artillery support. You know, now, just wanted to ask real quick. You were digging up the grave to make sure there wasn't a cache of weapons there. Right. That was, it, okay. to me, it's out in the middle of nowhere. I didn't see any footpaths or anything like that leading away from it. I kept, I felt that was, okay. the guy probably died on one of the marches. And, I, you know, I really didn't like doing it. You know, but they made us do it. I just, I just wanted to make sure we understood why they, why you were oh, yeah. <laughs> we were, it wasn't ghoulish or anything, but it was, it was, it, at the time, it's, you know, I know, I know where the logic was. 
You know, because every time you're on an operation, they were discovering tunnel complexes and so forth. And the thing about it was the big thing was to get at their supplies. You know, you get after their, uh, their weapons, their ammunition, and their food. You know, and that's a good way to defeat them, to beat the enemy, so forth. And then I got hauled back to base camp. We had some new uh, replacements in, and I started training people for some of the stuff that I did. Uh, one of my jobs, when I was assigned to fire direction control, I learned how to be a calculator. There's RTOs, radio telephone operators. We had six, six radios, six or seven radios, plus we had a switchboard communication to all the batteries. Uh, plus there was a separate radio, air advisory. And right away, uh, I was selected. I don't know why, because I was a quick thinker of the group, but uh, they put me on air advisory. And well, all it did was is every fire support base, even in base camp, when you have guns there, there's always fire going on. And what you did was, on that particular frequency, you talked to any helicopters or fixed-wing aircraft that came through the area, and you gave them um, if anybody was firing. You know, before they came into area. That was the first thing they did. They got on the horn to air advisory, and my call sign was Square Lobster. When I was in base camp, I was Square Lobster Dow Chang. On some of the operations, I was Square Lobster Shirley, Square Lobster Gold, and that was the location we were at. And you would give them the direction, max ord, which is the, uh, which is the height, and range. And... Uh, and that would basically tell them where it is, so that way they could either fly above it or fly around it, stuff like that. So, and that was it was common. Uh, my duty uh, on radio watch was twelve hour shifts, whether it was in base camp or out in the field. It was, uh, and they did it from midnight to noon and noon to midnight. You know, and we we used to change up once a week. You know, uh, so you're on for twelve hours. You know, you get a break and stuff like that. Uh, I was very proud to say that my whole year tour, I never had anybody, never had anybody get shot now. Uh, one of my replacements, that we did have an accident where they, they nailed a C-123 coming in the land where we were at base camp. They didn't give him the right information? Or? Uh, he, gave, he gave him the wrong information. I was out in the field. That's how I got called back from uh, Gasset. You know, they called me back in. Somebody screwed up. You know, I, they didn't realize how important I was. <laughs> <laughs> I used to get ribbed a lot, hey, you know, but uh, I mean, it, you know, you cost lives that way. Yeah. yeah. And then the big, the, then the real big operation I was on was, uh, it started in uh, the end of February the 27th, and it lasted all the way to the 17th of March. I mean, uh, that was phase one. It was Oper Operation Junction City. There were three phases to it. Phase one, phase two, started the 19th of March, ended... Uh, April 15th, and then Phase 3 went from the 16th of April all the way to the uh, May 14th. During the, That was a 50,000 GI operation. It was a big horseshoe. It was under 25th Division control, but the 25th was part of it. The 1st Division was part of it. Um, 3rd Brigade, uh, 4th Infantry Division, I was part of it. 11th Armored Cav, and that's where uh, the guy who commanded that was uh, Pershing's. Uh, I think it's either, yeah, it's a grandson. Um, let's see, 199th, 196, 173rd Airborne Brigade, something like about seven or, seven or eight uh, brigade, infantry brigades. And uh, it was in a horseshoe, and they, were, they really were now hot on the trail of the 9th VC Division. And we were in the north end of it uh, at Sui Tre. It was an abandoned village, big, big open area. I didn't see anything that resembled the village when they when they airlifted us in there. Uh, what what happened on phase two when the operation started was on the 19th of March. I remember they got me up about three in the morning, and they flew me to uh, uh, to Suida, which was uh, to our north. And uh, there's a mountain there. We could see it from our base camp miles away. It was a uh, Black Virgin Mountains, big, big mountain. There's radio, radio relay on the top of it. And it was a, uh, they had an airstrip there. It was all special forces camp there. And it was an Ar uh, Arvin cop on there. Uh, I remember I was there with the third, uh, let's see, A battery, A company, uh, second or the 12th infantry, one of the units that, uh, one of the battalions we supply, uh, uh, supported. And I remember, uh, they got me up at three, ate something real quick. Uh, I took my switchboard, 
my rucksack, my rifle. By this time, it was an M16. My uh, the switchboard and uh, a roll of quarter mile of roll of comma wire. And I got airlifted on. I was going to be on a dance party. I'm probably on the fifth or sixth assault helicopter coming in. Set up, you know, communications for the batteries when they come in. The you know to hook up from from each area. You know, the, each each little little head uh, each little headquarters uh, they set up. And I remember uh, I got pulled off. We loaded on and then we pulled off. Years later, I found out that the battalion commander of the second and the twelfth wanted artillery prep, and we weren't going to get it, which was kind of unusual. As it turned out, 3rd to 22nd got on. I got flown back to base camp, and uh, what actually happened is in the first assaults by the 3rd to 22nd, the first three helicopters were destroyed by command-detonated mines. I wound up convoying that later that day on the, uh, on the 19th, we convoyed on the Suey Trail. As we were going up, we were within, uh, I don't know, about 8 to 10 miles. Uh, three of the APCs were hit and destroyed. Uh, each one of them were suppressed to casualties. I believe there were 21 people died um, on those three, three aircraft that were blown up because there were no survivors on the first three. And I remember the APCs, I remember seeing them getting hauled away. You know, at least 19 were killed. Uh, never saw anything written up on that, which was kind of surprising. We wound up uh, detouring to back to Suida, because that was like the midpoint. And I remember spending the night in a special forces bunker. The next morning, we airlifted off and we assaulted it. By that, by this time, they had secured the fire support base. The command detonated mines, and the people that manned them were gone. Uh, we dug in on the 20th, and I remember, uh, you know, seeing the remnants of the the burned out helicopters, the only thing that were left were the booms, you know, the tail booms of the Hueys. And, uh, you know, you could see some of the stuff was still smoldering. What FSB was this? Uh-huh. That was Fire Support Base Gold, Suey Tray. Okay. Uh, the rest of the unit, all the guns got airlifted in. We were busy digging in. I remember uh, there was an order from Westmoreland that when you're on an operation out there on a fire support base, you have to have overhead cover within 24 hours. And usually you, you, you build a one-man little bunker. You know, you dig down in there, fill some sandbags and so forth, and you make an area for a sleeping bag, and you build it up about two feet, and you're going to be going down into the ground. You know, so that way you're, you're safe from any more, supposedly any more attack around it. Uh, I remember we didn't have tent chime because we were more concerned about the main operations bunker. And that's usually a good-sized room, you know. Because you're gonna, you got all those radios, you got a man, you got to set up chart tables and so forth, you know. And I remember uh, we worked as hard as we could, uh, and we got the bunker dug out and some sandbags going up, but we had poles across the top and a tarp at the end of at the end of the day. I was on radio watch from 12 noon to midnight. I remember about between 10 and 11, I had a uh, a forward air controller from the Air Force called me up, and they were running a, uh, what they call a SLAR mission, a side-looking airborne radar. And what the jets do, he coordinates that. Because the jets are on a different frequency. You always talk to uh, prop prop people, you know, the, the air controllers. They, you know, it's, it's that coordination between Army and Air Force. Uh, they run these triangular routes, you know, and they're down low. And they, they pick up movement at nighttime. That's usually, usually what happens. Uh, he had mentioned that about three kilometers due north from, from where we were at, that the whole grid square was lit up with small campfires. He says, I could see it. So I alerted our lieutenant, and uh, we uh, usually at nighttime, there's usually a, a gun crew that's on call for the whole night, and it's, it's hourly. It's called H&I Fire, uh, Harassment Incendiary. And what it is is they, we... Uh, you program everything to, uh, you give them, uh, you know, the direction, the coordinates and everything, where they're going to fire a couple of rounds every hour. And all it is is just this one, one out of 10,000 shot, they might hit something. But it's a harassment fire, basically. And what it is, it's, it's footpaths, footbridges, or where footpaths converge, stuff like that. They're going to be going down and we aren't, you know, at nighttime. So we figured that, you know, we, we alerted... Uh, one of, the gun, uh, one of the gun batteries, uh, 
uh, for a fire mission. I asked him if he would uh, give us coordinates. He gave us coordinates. We plotted it, got a fire mission going. We asked him that uh, if he would stay there to see, you know, where the rounds were, where the rounds were hitting. You're talking about the Air Force. Right, the Air Force, uh, for Air Controller. And what happened was, he mentioned that as soon as the rounds hit, all the lights went out, all the campfires went out. So I wrote it up in a, a small little report, handed the lieutenant. He should have passed it on to our battalion commander, who was John Vesey at the time, and uh, who later became chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. Uh, he was a lieutenant colonel at the time. And he, was, he took over, I believe, in February of 67. And then he left, I think, in May, after, you know, after the battle and the, another operation. Uh, it, it was one of those things that was slight. It was never given to him. Uh, I go off a radio watch at midnight. You know, uh, I sleep outside the bunker about 50, 60 feet away next to the log with, the, uh, with another guy. And then in the morning... That's when they. That's when the 272nd VC Regiment hit us. Uh, it started around between. About, I'd say it was after six, around 6:15 or so, 6:20. Um, Mortar round attack right off the bat. I heard explosions out in the uh, northeast corner. Uh, they came in from the north, 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 northeast corner, and also later on in the southeast corner. Had snipers along the east side of the. The, uh, the open area that we're in. Uh, the clearing was about 100, I, I want to say 200 yards long and 150 yards wide. Uh, uneven terrain, luckily. But I remember when all the mortar rounds started coming in, it's, it's how can I say it? They dropped the estimations uh, from what I've read in some of the articles, over 600 rounds on us and over 400 plus RPGs, rocket propelled grenades. Um, I mean, it, it was it was deafening, deafening. I mean, you almost couldn't pick up the uh, the automatic weapons fire. You know, it was so deafening. All this stuff. You know, uh, the one that woke me up was on, on the other side of the log, and uh, that lifted me right up in the air. And the first thing I grabbed were my glasses, my pants, my flak jacket, put my boots on, and raced to the freaking bunker. I left my rifle and everything else and all my web gear. I get in there in the bunker and. Um, you know, go man my switchboard and the radio and so forth. And I remember wounded started coming in. And there were so many wounded started walking, I started treating people, you know. And all, all you're doing is damaging people up. You take off that little first aid pack, which has got the, uh, the salt for burns, and then the other thing is the big bandage. You put a bandage on every damn thing, you know. I treated a guy, I had one guy that had, uh, uh, what's his name, Padilla. Big biceps, he had a bullet hole through his through his freaking uh, his bicep, you know. He almost minded. He literally went right through. You know, he was a. You know, he says it's it's getting numb. I remember I put a bandage on him. Uh, one of the guys I treated was Cook. I took. He was our. He was one of the uh, assistant commanders in our. When I took AIT down to Fort Sill, I met him down there uh, at Fort Sill, and he was actually a conscientious objector, and uh, he was not. He was part of I think either B battery or C battery, and he had a. A jaw wound. I remember when I treated him, I had to put his, make sure he was face down so it drained out away from him and not down his throat to choke him. You know, good looking guy too. James Cook, he was from Tennessee. Um, while I was in the bunker, it's wounded were coming in and some of the, some of the high officers were upset. And uh, my switchboard, uh, we had 10 antennas up around, around the bunker. So it was like a main area of for taking fire. And I remember uh, one of the guys I served with, Bobby Deshays, went out a few times to put the aerials back, back up. They were on bamboo poles plus the, the regular antenna that went up, uh, the aerial. And a lot of those aerials were from Jeeps, basically. You know, and you wanted to extend them up to get more range. And I remember my switchboard, I took it, it around, took out all the lines that were coming into the switchboard. So I had no communication with the other three firing batteries. Uh, about... I don't know how, how long the time elapsed. It seems like guys were coming in left and right. Um, I remember there was a young guy that came in in February, John Bolden from Pennsylvania. He was 19. He was already married. And we, we hit it off. He hit it off. We were one of, he was one of the replacements. I really liked him a lot. We, we really hit it off good. Uh, he's a little bigger than I am. Uh, they sent me out to man one of the guns. 
He said, you can't do any good with the switchboard, and obviously, don't worry about air advisory. Uh, so I, I, uh, my, uh, my section chief volunteered me to go out there, so Bolton went with me. And I remember we got halfway to uh, one of the guns in A battery. That was the closest firing battery, an RPG. I could watch the thing come through the air, hit the, hit the base of the gun and flip it over and set off some of the ammunition. I remember we looked around and going, what the hell are we doing out here? So, uh, and it was, we spotted some of the, the wounded, and then off to my left, when I was looking north, I could see human waves coming in, you know. And it, it was one of those things, it was like, why I never got hit I, was beyond me. I remember guys told me later on, they saw bullets kicking around near me, and because we were taking fire from two different directions. But I spotted, uh, we had a quad 50 in the northeast corner and a quad 50 in the southeast corner. And a quad 50 is, uh, they're vintage World War II, uh, four 50 calibers mounted with a seat in the center, and they're mainly for uh, anti-aircraft. But we had two of them assigned to us because they found out they were great for perimeter defense. One of them got hit by a um, recoilless rifle round, and the gunner was wounded. And I think it killed some of the gun crew. And he was crawling in. I spotted him. So we went out after him with a stretcher. Remember when I got to him, I could see, see his thigh bones on both sides. Remember, we got him on the stretcher, and it took us, it seemed like forever uh, to go, you know, we had to go well over 150 meters back to the southwest corner, which was the safest area to bring the wounded. And remember, uh, we were dodging all kinds of stuff. It took us like forever. We kept flopping down, taking fire, mortar rounds were dropping in. We get back there, and we went out again. I remember one guy that was in shock, uh, section chief in E6. Uh, I could see blood coming out of both eardrums. He had gotten knocked off, and a concussion from the blast didn't wound him, but knocked him right off his feet. He was in shock. I remember he was one of the guys that... Uh, later on, we, pulled, we put him on the stretcher, carried him to the back end, and he had grabbed my bicep. I remember I had bruises for about a week. We could see his handprint on my freaking bicep. He wouldn't let me go. You know, and there were so many guys that we treated. I think we went back out. We made several trips out there. Uh, when it was over, 11 out of 18 guns that were out of commission. Uh, the body count, I remember Bessie had asked me, uh, our battalion commander, I was one of the, uh, one of the people that was still uh, fairly able to move around, um, asked if we do a body count. And it seemed like you couldn't walk three or four feet without a body part or a torso right there. Uh, I mean, some of the stuff was horrific. I can remember looking at uh, somebody had fired an M79 grenade launcher while we were out there, and it hit, the, hit a Viet Cong right here, took out the back of his head. I can remember they were taking pictures, and I could literally look through his eyes from the back, you know. Some of the stuff was unbelievable, you know. Uh, and your body counts and fight for all remains with Viet Cong? Yes, yeah. They left, the, the official total was 647. They estimated with the blood trails out there, and the ground looked like it got painted in red toward the northeast. It was unbelievable. They, they dread. The healing waves, when they were coming in, a lot of them were hit. And they kept coming back. You know, they were hit, wounded. You could see them bandaged, and they were coming in. And uh, it was kind of a scary sight because they, uh, I talked to, I, I remember at one of the reunions, there were two guys from A Battery, from the first gun crew, gun crew one, two guys, Bobby Chiquette from Rhode Island and, uh, and uh, Besson from, uh, from New York. Uh, or on the first gun crew. That was actually the gun I was going to go, man, they wound up in a reactionary drill, which was some of the artillerymen grabbed their rifles and went to man either the southeast corner or the northeast corner to help out reinforce the 3rd and 22nd, which only had like a less than a company for perimeter, for an area that side. It was very, very small. And uh, we, we, you know, we all, we all talked about the amount of people we saw and stuff like that. You know, each, each, each one had, uh, you know, a different part to that that story from where they were at, but uh, I remember they they ran. I forget how many sorties. Uh, it's funny when the battle started, the clown cover was like treetop level, 
you know, it seemed like it was cloud cover all the way down. You couldn't see anything when you looked up, you know. The noise was deafening. I know they, they dropped napalm uh, on one side. I remember that because that kind of like took the oxygen out of the air. You know, it was one of those things, you know. It's, 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 it's kind of scary. It's like, it's like being explored, exposed to the doorway of hell. You know, it's, it's really, to me, I'm glad it was not dropped on me. It's really frightening stuff. But supposedly uh, they ran, I, I don't know if it's about 80 sorties or something like that, you know, with all the stuff. And then we had other, other fire support bases brought in artillery too. My unit wound up shooting over 2,200 rounds of artillery. At one point, I saw smoke go out there, which is harmless. I only shoot the guy right in the gut. Uh, it, it's amazing. And it, it, actually, the perimeter was collapsing. Uh, around, now officially, the, the, they write the battle lasted under four hours. I felt it was over because uh, on one of my trips to the southwest corner, I spotted elements of A, A Company 2nd of the 12th. Because these guys look fairly clean, you know, and, you know, they just, they were in this one area. I'm going, wait a minute. They should be manned in those two areas. They were waiting for uh, 2nd or the 22nd, and I think 35th Armor was coming in, or 34th Armor. Uh, in fact, the first, they, they were in a holding pat pattern waiting for armor support. And I remember the first vehicles toward the end of the battle, it had to be around 10 o'clock. The first thing that came through, first armored vehicle, was a tank retriever, you know, and that's, you know, it's, it's, it's an M48 without the, the gun turret, and it's got a big yoke for lifting up a, another armored vehicle, and there's two big 50 calibers on it. I can remember the guy's man in the 50s, and then the tanks came in, and the infantry after that, but it was amazing all the chaos that was going on, you know. Uh, it's not like you see in the movies, you know. I think the closest thing was Saving Private Ryan on the beginning of the movie when they're landing at, uh, at Normandy. Uh, it's deafening. You seem like you're moving in slow motion. Um, you know, uh, it, it, the chaos of it is unbelievable, you know. It's not organized at all, you know. Some people do try to organize people and stuff like that to get them going. But it, it, to me, it just seemed like it was so damn loud all the time. You know, it was, it was unbelievable. But uh, when it was over, luckily, I was one of the walking wounded. I had gotten hit above the knee, and I didn't realize until uh, after about three hours later when somebody said, you looks like you got red mud all over your pant leg. And we just, you know, discovered I had a whole bunch of flesh peeled off or gouged out from a, a fragment tape, mortar fragment. And uh, it's amazing. I never felt it. Never felt it at all. It, it did burn later on. Uh, and I got it, it was infected, but they, all they did was bandage it up and kept me out in the field for another 10 days. But the, uh, after when it was over, you're, you felt exhausted. I remember all the dignitaries coming in. I remember the ABC was there, CBS was there. A, yeah, ABC, CBS, and NBC. I could see all the camera people. Westmoreland came in, Seaman, who was the uh, deputy uh, MACV, Military Assistance Command, Vietnam. He was, he was on, right underneath Westmoreland. He was former First Division Commander. Uh, I got to talk with him and didn't realize it at the time. <laughs> I was talking to a three-star general. Uh, but there were all kinds of stuff there. Everybody came in. Everybody had to be there to see what was there. And then um, later in the afternoon, uh, after the body count was over and we were starting to police up the area, and uh, I remember the... They dropped in a bulldozer. Guys started getting the bodies. They dug out this huge freaking trench, must have been about 50, 60 yards long, and they started bulldozing the bodies in, you know, and covering it up. And some of the guns were taken out, some of the guns were replaced, and addition supplies, more personnel came in from Dodge Yang, stuff like that to finish the operation. But uh, it was it was quite an experience. Quite an experience. Do you remember what the what do you have an idea about what they the count was for the American side? Yeah, it was, at, when it was all done, because some people died days later, uh, 36 killed, 190 wounded. What I didn't like about some of the uh, articles in uh, Tropic Lightning, 25th Division, and uh, Star, Pacific Stars and Stripes, and some articles later on in some of the magazines, generations later, they had 109 all the time. And that always upset me, because I was the guy with the, you know, 
with the clipboard that went around to verify everything. I mean, he tagged 190 people. To tag you, you're wounded. You know? That's it. You know? And to me, it sanitized it that way. You know, 386, and this is what happened. And some guys were from other units, but the others, it was really devastating, you know. I mean, we kicked butt, but it's, I mean, it cost. It really cost. It was, years later, they think we were staked out like sheep, you know, for a tiger. They Basically, they felt we were bait. I couldn't figure it out. We were usually close support for uh, three infantry battalions, second or the 12th infantry, second or the 22nd, which was mechanized. They went in the APCs, those noisy things. And third to twenty second. Those were our three battalions we took care of, and you know, we always felt that we were the bait to draw them in. You know, they were devastated. I mean, they lost, they lost a tremendous amount of people. I can't figure the amount wounded that they had from that division. You know, twenty five hundred. You figured they lost more than half killed. You figured a lot of them had to be wounded. You know. So, and plus they lost a lot of weapons. We had stuff stacked like you wouldn't believe.